few minutes and introduce Dr. Cohen. Uh, Dr. Cohen is a behavioralist, behavioral neurologist, and has a passion for memory and personal life experiences with Alzheimer's. So I am going to let her do the self-introduction as we arranged. And Justine is going to manage any uh, questions that you may have. Now, doc, uh, Dr. Cohen, how would you like that? Do you want people to hold off on their questions or what, what is your comfort level? Um, I think for the flow of the presentation, it'd be best to hold off. I'll make sure I leave lots of time for questions and answers. Uh, so we'll, we'll open it up to questions at the end of the talk. Okay, thank you. So away you go. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Terry, for having me. It's a pleasure being here with everyone. Um, and, and happy fall. It's a beautiful season. Um, I am a neurologist. My specialty is Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. Uh, I am a um, graduate of the University of Toronto uh, and did my fellowship in behavioral neurology there. And then I established Toronto Memory Program, which is a community-based memory clinic and research site for um, diagnosis and treatment of individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. Um, our research center is a go-to center in Canada. We are well known actually internationally and have contributed substantially to uh, treatment research uh, over the past 20 years. So I'm excited to share with you some of the things that are going on in the research pipeline in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is a terrible disease, as many of you know, and uh, we're now um, in a period of hopefulness about having better diagnosis and treatment. So I will share my slides. Um, let me just make sure. Okay, I hope that you're seeing my slides there. Looks good. Okay, thanks, Justine, for confirming. So, so we'll begin. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the progress that's being made in Alzheimer's disease diagnosis and treatment. And my specific goals are to provide you with an update on recent advances in research in these areas and to discuss the impact of breakthroughs that we expect to occur uh, on our healthcare system. Are we ready for these breakthroughs and what do we need to do to take full advantage of breakthroughs? Um, I also wanted to provide an opportunity for a call to action for those of you who may be interested in contributing either to research or finding out more about your own risk or situation, either for yourself or someone that you know or care about. So let's start with rethinking the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. The story started over a century ago in 1906 when a German neurologist and psychiatrist, Dr. Alwa Alzheimer, described the first known patient with Alzheimer's disease. She was a German housewife, Auguste Dieter, and she developed memory symptoms, loss of memory, at the, the young age of 40, or in her 40s anyway, and she came to the attention of Dr. Alzheimer in her early 50s. He followed her until her death at age 55 and autopsied her brain. And he described the characteristic changes in the brain at autopsy of plaques and tangles. At the time, this was thought to be a rare disease, but if we fast forward to 2021, we know that this is anything but rare. It's a pandemic with 55 million individuals worldwide suffering from Alzheimer's disease, and the numbers are going up such that by 2030, not too far from now, there will be 75 million individuals affected. Here are some of the more famous celebrities or uh, politicians who developed Alzheimer's disease later in life. And we, when we say later in life, we mean over the age of 65. 
Um, but we know that 8% or even up to 10% of individuals develop Alzheimer's disease symptoms under the age of 65. And you see here on your left, John Mann, who is a, um, a rock uh, band front man for Spirit of the West, who died of Alzheimer's disease in his 50s just a few years ago. And on your right, you see the actress Julianne Moore, who played Alice in the movie Still Alice, and she developed Alzheimer's disease at the age of 50. So the World Health Organization uh, back in 2012 declared Alzheimer's disease an urgent healthcare priority, not just because of the staggering numbers, but because of the severity of the disease. It takes an autonomous, uh, independent individual and over several years renders them completely dependent on others for survival. And ultimately, this is a fatal disease. Um, there is an enormous cost associated with care, not just to the healthcare system, but to the individuals and their families. And despite it being common, the disease is fraught with underdiagnosis, misdiagnosis, and delayed diagnosis. So only 50% of people actually receive a diagnosis in life, and usually after many years of trying to um, uh, get a diagnosis, or at least several years of having symptoms. And why is that? Why is it so hard to diagnose Alzheimer's disease? Well, for a number of reasons. Uh, first being that patients may not recognize that there's anything wrong with their memory. The part of the brain that allows you to assess how you're doing is actually not always working in Alzheimer's disease. So even in the face of significant memory problems, someone may not realize there's anything wrong and therefore not seek uh, medical attention. And for those who are insightful and do realize there's something wrong, they may be fearful about coming forward, fearful of stigma, fearful of uh, a bad diagnosis, loss of independence, loss of driver's license, becoming a burden, many realistic fears that people have that prevent them from coming forward. When someone does see a physician, the physician may lack skill and may lack interest in diagnosing Alzheimer's disease because they don't feel they have a lot to offer or don't have the expertise to be sure about the diagnosis. And the symptoms are often confused with normal aging. When cognitive tests are done, these may be insensitive for early disease. So a whole host of reasons that conspire against accurate and early timely diagnosis. What we do know is that Alzheimer's disease is more than a dementia. Dementia just refers to the state of not being able to look after oneself independently because of loss of cognitive abilities. That is the last stage of Alzheimer's disease. The first stage begins without symptoms. It's called the preclinical stage and can last up to 20 years when changes are going on in the brain. Uh, but um, not enough brain cells have been injured or died yet to cause symptoms. Symptoms will gradually emerge. This is a progressive disease. And after 15 to 20 years of uh, abnormal changes in the brain, one enters the stage of MCI, that stands for mild cognitive impairment, and that lasts on average another five years. And here people are still independent in banking, shopping, driving, doing their day-to-day -day activities, but there is a change in their memory. They are aware of uh, memory problems and on cognitive testing um, in a physician's hands, we can see that memory is not normal for age or education. And then gradually the MCI stage will give way to the dementia stage, which lasts an additional 10 years. So we have a disease that spans over 30 years with an early phase where people are still functioning very, very well. Uh, and that's where we would like to be diagnosing and, and doing something to turn this disease around. Throughout the entire disease, there are two proteins that are particularly injurious to the brain. And these are the plaques and tangles that Dr. Alwa Alzheimer saw at autopsy, but he didn't know what they were made up of. So the plaques are amyloid. We now can characterize that um, uh, from a molecular standpoint. And the other protein is tau. Uh, and you can see what would be uh, a light microscope um, uh, slice of the brain uh, at autopsy showing amyloid and tau accumulation in the brain. 
the whole brain at autopsy is small in Alzheimer's disease. It has shrunken. Uh, it has lost at least a third of its brain cells. Um, they've dropped out because they've died and this accounts for the shrinkage of the brain. However, diagnosing at autopsy provides information to the family, but doesn't help that individual who succumbed to the disease. So the whole question is, can we make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in life, not after death? And can we do it in life early enough in the disease that we can actually salvage brain cells or have a chance to do that? And the answer is unequivocally, yes, we can. We have the tools to do this. The gold standard tools are a PET scan using amyloid tracers, so a PET amyloid scan. And uh, the other option is spinal evaluation. So one can uh, do a spinal tap, um, extract spinal fluid, send it to a lab and get a readout of amyloid and tau measurement. So this is very important. It's very significant. It means that Alzheimer's disease is a diagnosis that can be made in life. We don't need to wait till autopsy. It also means that Alzheimer's disease is not simply a diagnosis of exclusion. We don't just rule out strokes and tumors and say, okay, because we can't find anything like that, that this must be Alzheimer's or it's probably Alzheimer's. We can be much more specific now by seeing whether amyloid is present on a PET scan or in the spinal fluid. Um, and once you are able to make accurate diagnoses, this paves the way to better um, uh, exploration of new treatments. It's very hard to develop treatments for a disease when you cannot diagnose it accurately, just the way we can't make COVID-19 uh, vaccines if we weren't able to characterize the COVID uh, uh, virus. Um, and uh, with early diagnosis, the hope is that we have better outcomes, that we're going earlier in the disease where people are still functioning well. And if we can preserve that stage or slow down progression of the disease, then we'll have better outcomes. So here you see someone in a PET scanner and on the uh, right, you see the red areas of the brain and this is amyloid. Uh, so this brain is lighting up uh, with the presence of a large amount of amyloid plaque. And the presence of amyloid does not tell you the stage of the disease. This person may have no symptoms. They may be at the mild cognitive impairment stage or they may be at the dementia stage. So we see amyloid present as the hallmark protein of Alzheimer's disease. A spinal tap is the alternative way to get this diagnosis, and we do these fairly frequently in our clinic every week. Um, it's a fairly easy procedure that we do in the office with some local freezing and a little needle to withdraw some spinal fluid. So why isn't this being done more often or why don't people know about this? Well, PET scans are expensive and they're not covered by OHIP yet. Uh, and PET tracers and PET scanners are limited um, in the numbers that we have and, and the access we have. Um, and spinal fluid requires a spinal tap, a lumbar puncture to be performed, and not everybody is um, amenable to this. Um, as I said, it's mostly an easy procedure, but if one's on uh, blood thinners, this may not be safe to do, or if one has had spinal surgery, it may not be possible. And we also don't have a local lab or Canadian lab to send the spinal fluid to. So we actually send the spinal fluid to Amsterdam. It's all doable, but it's not ideal and increases the cost. So in the future, we expect to have blood tests to uh, give us a prediction of amyloid levels in the brain. The first blood test of this kind was actually released for commercial use in the United States in 2020. It's called the Precivity uh, blood test, and we expect many other blood tests to come to the market over the next few years. And this will revolutionize um, a diagnosis in Alzheimer's disease. It will mean perhaps at the family practice level, one can go and have a, have a screening blood test for Alzheimer's disease. Another technology uh, for detecting Alzheimer's disease is a retinal scan, taking a picture of the back of the eye. The back of the eye is the front of the brain and uh, one can detect the signature of amyloid in the back of the eye. You need a special camera, a hyperspectral camera, and this is uh, um, 
uh, currently a project under development and validation at Toronto Memory Program, uh, where I work in conjunction with a company called ReadySpec. So this is an exciting way that optometrists and ophthalmologists can actually play a role in the future in detecting Alzheimer's disease early in the disease. There's also genetic testing, which is important, uh, important in two ways. There are gene mutations that can directly cause Alzheimer's disease if inherited, and these are rare. There are many of them, but they are rare. They run in families and they are inherited in what we call an autosomal dominant fashion. They often cause Alzheimer's symptoms at a young age, uh, in one's 40s or 50s. Uh, generally before age 65, and they can be diagnosed by a blood test. So if someone has a strong family history of Alzheimer's disease or close family members who have developed Alzheimer's disease under the age of 65, um, a blood test can be done to look for the gene mutation that may be running through the family to rule that in or out. And for those who have gene mutations, there are clinical research options for treatment. Um, and the Ministry of Health covers the cost of the blood tests for uh, genetic testing in Alzheimer's disease. There's another way that genetics is important. These gene mutations that directly cause Alzheimer's are rare. However, uh, risk genes are common. And uh, the most important risk gene for Alzheimer's disease is the APOE gene. The APOE gene comes in three types. These three types are not mutations, they're normal gene variations. And it is the type called APOE4 that confers the higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. And individuals who have a higher risk uh, by virtue of APOE4 are also uh, um, individuals who could participate in Alzheimer's prevention studies. So we're looking for people who are at higher risk and offering uh, through clinical trials, uh, prevention interventions, uh, in the hope that individuals will never go on to develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Here you see Kathy Barrick, who is the CEO of the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, who approached us and said, I'd like to lead by example. I'd like to have a cheek swab and, and have my APOE uh, tested. And if I'm at risk, I'd like to participate in research. And she really wanted to show people that this is not so scary. This is one way that uh, people can, can find out more about their risk, their genetics and do something about it. So you see with the APOE4 gene, if you have one copy, you have a threefold higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. If you inherit two copies of APOE4, your risk goes up tenfold. Even those individuals with this tenfold risk, not all of them will develop Alzheimer's disease, but it is a substantial risk and, uh, and worthy of consideration. Um, on your right, you see the Spartan Cube. This is the smallest DNA analyzer in the world. It was developed by uh, Spartan Bioscience in Ottawa. Uh, and uh, the, the cheek swab specimen is inserted into a cartridge in this cube and analyzed, and we get a result in one hour. So it's quite, quite remarkable. So diagnosing is important. It's the gateway to information, to prognosis, to development of new treatments. And now I want to turn to what's happening in terms of new treatments in Alzheimer's disease. So we do have some existing medications. We've had these for about 20 years. Uh, they're specific for Alzheimer's disease, but they are not enough. Uh, these two classes of medicines deal with uh, trying to boost chemicals that are deficient in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they fall into the groups of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, that's the uh, CHEIs, or glutamate modulators. And as I say, they've been around for 20 years. They are standard uh, treatment, uh, often prescribed by family physicians and by specialists. And they have only modest benefit to symptoms, so not nothing, but uh, for most people, they don't give a dramatic response. They may help a little bit. They do not prevent or slow the underlying changes in the brain. They don't touch the amyloid or the tau. So people continue to progress in their disease, although their symptoms may be um, better than if they weren't on the medication. Um, notably, 
none of these medications have ever been approved for the mild cognitive impairment stage of Alzheimer's disease. So people have to be uh, fairly symptomatic before they are prescribed these medications. So after many years of failure in drug development, uh, um, there is new hope. Uh, you know, we are due for a breakthrough. It's been a long time uh, since the last uh, of these drugs that I just described uh, came to the market and we need uh, new treatments that will more substantially deal with Alzheimer's disease. The, the drugs currently under investigation and the trial designs with which, within which they're being tested are much more sophisticated than in years gone by. And the investment in Alzheimer's research has also increased, although it still lags behind investment in cancer and other therapeutic areas, but it has improved. And furthermore, a first disease slowing or disease modifying drug has just been approved by the FDA in June of this year. The drug is called aducanumab or aduhelm. Some of you may have heard of it, not yet approved in Canada, but um, we are hopeful that it will be. Um, so uh, lots going on in the, the research pipeline. I want to show you um, a complicated diagram, but I'll simplify it for you by explaining all of these little uh, colored shapes within the, uh, the three circles represent individual um, compounds that are being developed for Alzheimer's disease in the research pipeline. The outer circle consists of those drugs being developed in phase one. Uh, the middle uh, ring uh, shows you the compounds under development in phase two, and the inner circle contains the drugs under development in phase three. So you see at a glance that there are drugs at all stages of development, phase one, two, and three. That is important because at each stage of development, drugs will drop out, either they're not safe enough or they're not effective enough. Uh, and so you need to keep replenishing uh, the pipeline with new drugs coming in at phase one and phase two in order to have successes in phase three. And uh, the next thing I want to point out is the color scheme. Um, all of those drugs that are tackling amyloid are in red. So they tackle amyloid in different ways, uh, either by removing it or preventing its formation. But you can see that there's quite a bit of uh, red and especially in phase two and phase three in the, um, at the green wedge uh, called disease modifying biologics. Um, and the drugs in phase three in that wedge are the ones that are most likely to come to the market in the next few years. All of the drugs in blue tackle tau. So again, we have drugs tackling the other key protein pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And then there are a large number of drugs in the pipeline that are colored yellow. And these tackle inflammation. And we know that the immune system uh, is disordered in Alzheimer's disease and contributes to um, the pathologic features of the disease. And so we have a number of drugs now that in various ways are either boosting the immune system to do a better job or dampening down the immune system to reduce inflammation in the brain. Uh, so, and there are, there are drugs with other colors here. I won't go into that, but what you should take away from this is that we're not putting our eggs all in one basket. We've got a large number of diverse compounds uh, at different stages of development with different mechanisms of action. So tackling the disease in a variety of different ways. And uh, two thirds of the pipeline is what we call a disease modifying approach. Uh, trying to slow down or arrest the disease. And about a third of the pipeline is devoted to treating symptoms. Uh, and both are important, both are necessary, but in the past we only had symptom treatments and that certainly wasn't enough. We also see that um, the current pipeline tackles the disease at different stages. So not just the dementia stage, which was the approach uh, several years ago, but now there are a large number of trials for individuals with mild cognitive impairment and also for individuals with preclinical or asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease. So really prevention trials is what we're talking about here. People who have no symptoms, but may be at risk or maybe already have amyloid accumulating in the brain. 
I want to briefly describe the drug that was approved in the United States in June uh, and is um, being reviewed by Health Canada and other regulators as well. Um, in 2016, um, this was the cover of Nature magazine. Uh, what it shows is a PET amyloid scan of an individual with Alzheimer's disease um, on your left, and the red is the amyloid plaque. And on the right is the same individual after treatment with the drug aducanumab, which has completely, in this case, cleared the amyloid plaque. So the amyloid plaque has been removed with this antibody. In June 2021, the FDA approved aducanumab uh, via the accelerated uh, pathway approval based on its substantial impact on amyloid removal and the likelihood that this will lead to clinical improvement in an individual's day-to-day -day function and cognition. So aducanumab is an antibody. It grabs amyloid from the brain and clears it out of the brain. And in one of its two pivotal studies in phase three in individuals with mild cognitive impairment and mild Alzheimer's dementia, individuals who received the optimal dose of the drug showed less decline in their cognition over 18 months, less decline in their activities of daily living, so more likely to be driving after 18 months than those who weren't treated, more likely to be shopping, banking, independent in activities. Uh, they had less emergence of psychiatric symptoms, um, we know that Alzheimer's disease is not just a disease of memory, but also causes anxiety, agitation, irritability, and a whole host of other psychiatric symptoms. So individuals treated with aducanumab also show less emergence of these symptoms uh, and the dramatic clearance of amyloid, as well as downstream reduction in tau and reduction in the loss of brain cells. So it was the first drug approved in 18 years uh, for Alzheimer's disease. That in and of itself is significant. It's taken a long time to get from the drugs we have already to this new drug. Um, the first drug to clear amyloid and the first drug approved for the mild cognitive impairment stage, not just the dementia stage of Alzheimer's disease. And if it approved in Canada, uh, that will likely be the same. Um, it's the first drug for Alzheimer's disease to be given by intravenous infusion rather than a pill. So these are monthly infusions that individuals would receive. And the first drug to require an amyloid test to confirm that the individual actually has the diagnosis before they're put on the treatment. And if you think about cancer therapy, we wouldn't radiate or give someone cancer chemotherapy if we weren't sure by tissue diagnosis or biopsy that they actually had the cancer. So now we're being much more specific about diagnosing in order to properly treat. Um, and because the drug can cause some uh, brain swelling and other side effects, often without symptoms, but detected on an MRI scan, we need to have uh, a regular schedule of MRI scan monitoring uh, for individuals who are on aducanumab. Two weeks after the FDA approved aducanumab, it granted breakthrough therapy designation to two other anti-amyloid drugs. So this idea of accelerating the field, once you have a first drug in class approved, then many others follow that is holding up here. So breakthrough therapy designation doesn't mean these next drugs are approved. It means the FDA has confidence in these compounds and wants to work more closely with the drug developers of these compounds to speed up their um, programs and to uh, dialogue with them about what the FDA would want to see in order to grant approval. So lecanemab, denanemab, they also clear amyloid substantially from the brain. Um, they have shown good evidence of slowing disease as well as clearing amyloid plaque in their um, phase two programs. Uh, in individuals with MCI and early Alzheimer's disease dementia. Uh, and they are also um, uh, being used in prevention studies. So they, the acylocanumab prevention study will begin in Canada and specifically at Toronto Memory Program 
next month. We're very excited about that. And the Denanumab uh, study sometime next year. So we, we have a, a fair expectation that we'll have not just one new disease slowing drug on the market in the US, uh, but possibly three by uh, you know, uh, the next year or two, and these will likely come to Canada as well. So uh, it's not all about anti-amyloid drugs. Um, uh, there are many anti-tau uh, drugs in the pipeline, as you saw from, from the, the uh, picture that I showed you earlier. Uh, these are exciting programs and many uh, programs uh, with uh, immunotherapy or uh, tackling the immune system. So again, many shots on the goal and uh, great hopefulness that we are in a new era of uh, capability to slow down Alzheimer's disease. We don't want to ignore symptoms. It's important to treat symptoms as well. And in China in 2019, uh, a new symptom treatment was approved for mild to moderate stage Alzheimer's disease. This is a purified extract of seaweed. It's called GV971. And in the China phase three study that led to its approval there, um, what this seaweed extract showed was an earlier symptom benefit. People showed improvement in symptoms within a few weeks rather than needing a few months to show that. They showed a greater magnitude of symptom improvement and the symptom improvement lasts for a longer period of time. So currently there is a global phase three study to replicate these results. And uh, we are one of the participating sites. This is a, a very well tolerated uh, plant extract that individuals can try. Um, and it is not uh, taken together with standard therapy with the cholinesterase inhibitors or memantine, uh, the drugs that have already been approved because uh, the way this drug works, GV971, is it alters the bacterial composition in the gut, in the gastrointestinal tract, which in turn changes the brain uh, to a non-inflammatory state. It's a very interesting kind of mechanism. Uh, and um, for people who are on the, the uh, currently existing background therapies, uh, this drug GV971 can't actually correct the bacterial composition of the gut. So it's for people who either have not uh, ever tried the, the current therapies or couldn't tolerate them or didn't get benefit from them. So a very interesting new uh, approach to treating symptoms. So what about our healthcare system? We know uh, that it's not enough to have a breakthrough therapy. You need to have a healthcare system that is ready to uh, deploy uh, that therapy and uh, uh, that people can afford uh, and can access the new treatments. So, in order to be successful uh, with a disease modifying therapy, for sure, we will need improved public awareness. People need to come forward to uh, be aware that there is uh, you know, something that can help them and that it's worth um, having their uh, memory symptoms explored. We will need family doctors and specialists also to improve their, their knowledge of, of diagnosis and uh, of new treatments. Um, we'll need to have improved uh, access to technology. So that means we need to have access to PET amyloid scans or spinal taps or to the new blood tests, retinal scans, and these need to be affordable. So we'll need to have a different funding model because uh, PET scans are expensive uh, and um, there aren't enough of them. We need someone to help navigate, uh, you know, what, which amyloid test and, and who's gonna pay for it. Um, Memory uh, clinic uh, specialists um, are not very plentiful across the country, and we need to improve access to memory specialists uh, and reduce the wait lists. And we'll also need to have access to infusion centers or home infusions. Uh, we don't want people to have to go to a hospital setting once a month to receive an intravenous infusion of, of treatment. Uh, and then we'll need more access to MRI scans if we're having biologics that uh, are infused and need to be monitored with MRI scans. So a whole host of things will have to change. And I think that we should gear up for this challenge and uh, make sure that we are doing our job with education and that we're establishing regional diagnosis and treatment centers, 
We can create new roles with uh, Alzheimer's care navigators so people are not confused about how to access uh, diagnosis and treatment and have someone to, to guide them through the various steps. We need a Canadian lab for spinal fluid and, and uh, blood analysis for amyloid rather than shipping to out of country labs and uh, community-based infusion centers. So I think these things are doable in other therapeutic areas. Um, the population and the healthcare system and physicians have pivoted to give uh, biologics for rheumatoid arthritis and for other diseases. We have to make it a priority for Alzheimer's disease. So don't doubt progress, help accelerate it. It is only a matter of time before Alzheimer's disease becomes much more treatable. And people who know this disease often want to be involved. So there's lots of things that people can do. You could have a baseline memory test. Uh, you could join our prevention and treatment registry, undergo a cheek swab, or have a blood test to look at genetic risk and find out if a clinical trial is right for you or for someone you care about. Um, we all have a role to play in ending this bad disease, and I believe that we are moving closer and we want to protect next generations because our children and grandchildren will have a lot of other things to worry about in this world besides worrying about Alzheimer's disease. So um, you've met briefly Justine Raum, who is on the meeting with me. Uh, she and Lindsay Snow uh, work very hard at Toronto Memory Program to uh, connect with individuals, answer their questions, uh, provide uh, uh, assistance in setting up free memory testing or whatever it is that might be useful. And even though we're located in Toronto, we do not have a restrictive catchment area. We see people even from out of province. So um, we're, we're very accessible and, and would love to be helpful um, at, your, at your leisure and convenience. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and I will um, be happy to answer any questions. Perfect. So if you have questions, you can definitely write them in the chat box. Otherwise, I guess one by one, you can unmute and um, ask your questions to Dr. Cohen. So Dr. Cohen, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I have a question for you. I know that when I saw you speak at the Bradford Probus Club, you were doing uh, the, the swabs, the cheek swabs, is that something available during COVID times or that is a mail-in option or how, how would that happen if someone here from our membership wanted to access a, a cheek swab? Yes, so uh, we are still doing cheek swabs, but we're not doing them at community events. So we arrange appointments for people to come in and have them done here on site. And we have all the appropriate precautions and, and PPE. So it's, it's worked out very well. We hope to have cheek swab events in the future, but with COVID right now, it's on site appointments. And, and uh, you, you were going to, you will send us some information so that if people want to connect with you, uh, I can post that on our website. In our yeah, so I'll be sending a link mm -hmm. and you can register for a memory screen, a cheek swab, or to learn about research opportunities. Okay. Thank you, Justine. That's great. And for, so the cheek swab is, is um, available for the APOE testing, so the risk gene testing. But if somebody has um, additional risk of um, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease or the, of one of these gene mutations, that is something that we need a blood test for, or we can send a, um, a kit to collect saliva. So it depends what genetic test. So Justine will be very helpful in sorting out what makes sense for any given individual. And, and the testing is covered by OHIP? Yes, and, it is. And the evaluations are all covered by OHIP? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I do. Okay. Um, uh Brother is currently on a drug called, I'll spell it, D O N E P E Z I L. You know uh, who that is? Yeah. Lady that walks the dog to talk to. Sure. Oh, to yeah. So that's memory. Um, it really doesn't seem to be doing much good for him. And is would he be on that drug? Would he be in the MCI sort of stage? 
So that drug, thank you for spelling it, Dinepazil, is one, that was actually the first drug ever approved uh, to treat Alzheimer's disease. The approval by Health Canada was in 1997. And the formal indication is for Alzheimer's disease dementia. So although a physician might prescribe it off label for the mild cognitive impairment stage, it is formally indicated for the dementia stage, meaning individuals who are uh, not 100% independent in day-to-day -day activity. Um, so it is one of these symptom treatments that gives modest benefit. Um, Two thirds of individuals will get some benefit, one third won't. Um, and um, we don't have a good way of predicting who will get benefit, but if he's not benefiting from it, then there are other options uh, through the, the research program. Um, and um, the GV971 is one example uh, for people who perhaps are not getting benefit from uh, Dinepazil, but there, there are many others. Some, you know, with some research programs, you can add on to Dinepazil, with others, you do it instead of Dinepazil. Um, so if he's interested, we can certainly, Justine would be a great uh, resource to sort that out. He's currently being seen, I think it's called the Kortha Aging Clinic. Right. Um, yes. so we, in Bob Cajun, so it wouldn't be difficult to bring him down to Toronto. Right, yes. Perfect. Any other questions? Does the diet play any role in the, the affecting Alzheimer's or not? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do think that a whole host of lifestyle factors do influence risk for Alzheimer's disease. And diet is one of those lifestyle factors, or so it's called. Um, and um, the, the current thinking is that a diet that is low in animal fat, low in red meat, um, uh, low in sugar and salt, so it's starting to sound like a a heart healthy diet is the best diet for the brain. So rather than stating the things that you should avoid, the things that one should uh, enjoy are um, a lot of fresh fruit, vegetables, um, uh, salads, nuts, um, fish, um, and, and poultry more than the red meat. Uh, uh, so, um, so the, what I'm describing really is the Mediterranean diet that is still felt to be the best diet for brain health. We know that there are lots of people who follow uh, a very good diet and still end up with Alzheimer's. So it's not an absolute prevention or protection, but it does uh, help the brain uh, uh, sort of build up some reserve. Um, these extreme diets that you hear about, the ketogenic diets or uh, diets that are, you know, full of all of these supplements, they're not proven to be helpful. And in some cases, they are harmful. So I think a balanced diet is your best bet and try to avoid some of the uh, fatty foods and red meat. Thank you. Oh, Carl, I think you're muted. I'll just unmute you right now. Um, it should pop up on your screen. The host has asked you to unmute. Got it. There you go. There you, there you go. So I'm just curious, do all Alzheimer's patients uh, have amyloid and tau material in their brain? And do all people with amyloid and tau in their brain have Alzheimer's? Yeah, great question. So, so you, you don't have Alzheimer's without presence of those materials yes. yes okay so the so let me just back up a little bit you must have amyloid to have alzheimer's disease and if you have amyloid then you're on that alzheimer's spectrum you might have what we call preclinical alzheimer's you haven't developed enough tau yet you don't have symptoms yet but you will over time uh, by the MCI stage of Alzheimer's disease, people already have tau present. So there's sort of a, pro a biological progression, starting with amyloid, then tau. And some people would say inflammation comes later, or so others would say it's actually there at the beginning, but you need amyloid and tau 
uh, for full-blown Alzheimer's disease, but amyloid would be enough for that very early stage. I heard you. Thank you. You're welcome. And it, we used to think that, um, or it used to be said that 30% of normal people have amyloid, so it's not specific for Alzheimer's. We don't believe that anymore. We just feel that um, it is a matter of time before people develop symptoms. So it's like having um, a little nest of cancer cells, if you will, accept the analogy that it hasn't caused symptoms yet, but it is not normal and leaving it leaves people vulnerable over time to that cancer growing and spreading. So it's the, it's the same kind of analogy. Can you differentiate a little bit between dementia and Alzheimer's? Yes, for sure. So dementia describes the state of being, um, it, sorry, let me, let me just backtrack. Dementia means that someone is no longer able to function independently in all activities because of a decline in their memory and thinking. So dementia does not um, uh, speak to a specific cause. It's uh, a syndrome of not being able to function independently. So maybe I need someone to do the banking or the driving for me, or maybe I need more help. Maybe I need someone to help me with meal preparation and, and dressing and toileting. I'm not independent, that's dementia. And the reason is not for physical reasons, it's because my thinking and memory aren't good enough. Now, Alzheimer's disease is the commonest cause of dementia in uh, seniors, it's the commonest cause, but Alzheimer's disease itself is more than a dementia. It starts without symptoms, it uh, progresses through a mild cognitive impairment stage where people are still independent despite memory problems, and then it moves into a dementia phase. Other conditions that cause dementia can include a stroke, um, brain cancer, a head injury, you know, I'm hit by a bus and my thinking's not right from then on, uh, and I can't function properly, I can't do my job, so I'm not independent in work anymore. So that could be a head injury induced or brain trauma induced dementia. So you can see there are many causes of dementia, but Alzheimer's disease is the, the most common one. Sounds almost like it's the best one because there are things you can do to treat it with some of the others you can't. Well, that's the hope that we will, we will uh, crack open the, the, the treatment uh, gold mine and, and be able to even prevent it in the future. Yeah. So are there any more questions that anyone has? I think Josie has a question. I'm just gonna ask you to unmute Josie. Uh, so there should be a button that pops up on your screen that says host asks you to unmute. Otherwise at the bottom left, there you go. Oh, thank you, thank you. If your system is highly inflammatory to the point where you're on prednisone on a regular basis, is that an indication that you may develop Alzheimer's as you continue? Yeah, Josie, that's a good question. So certain inflammatory conditions, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, are known to be associated with a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. So the inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis is not just in the, the joints, uh, but it's also in the brain. Um, and treatment of rheumatoid arthritis with anti-inflammatories, uh, specifically um, uh, certain of the, the most uh, recent anti-tumor uh, necrosis uh, medication can drastically reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, not just treat the rheumatoid arthritis. So being on prednisone, prednisone is used for many different inflammatory conditions. It would depend on the specific condition. Um, prednisone itself does not uh, protect against Alzheimer's disease, but it might um, indirectly help the brain if the uh, inflammatory condition being treated is brought under control. Thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. Elaine? Oh, you're just muted. Hello, Dr. Cohen. Hi. This is not a question. It's rather more of a comment uh, on your presentation. And I, first of all, send a great big thank you for your message of hope. 
uh, as well as the explanation, because for years, you know, the confusion between, well, what's Alzheimer's, what's dementia? You have beautifully laid that out. And again, I really thank you. Uh, and I thank you for your invitation as to how, you know, we as a population can support the, the future testing and, and hopefully breakthrough. You're so welcome. Thank you very much for your feedback. I appreciate it. I don't think, I think that was a, a lovely closing. You, you've done a wonderful job. We look forward to receiving whatever information you want to share. And thank you again for allowing us to record this so the members can access it at another time if they want to, in case they've forgotten. Okay, so with that, <laughs> With that, um, let's have a thank you, silent hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we appreciate all you've done. So thank you so much. Pleasure being with you. I wish you a good rest of the week. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, as well, for all thank you've you. done to coordinate. No problem. Okay. So Bye now. Is, we have a we have a bowl of names instead of a wheel of names. So you can see me. Mix them up and we will draw three names. The first one is Diane Hunt. I'm not sure what your prize will be, but you have won a prize. Who else is here? Um, the next one is Lorraine Graham. Congratulations. And the last one is Sigrid. You have won and you're muted, but we'll send you out your prize. Give me a couple of days to get this together. They will come out at the end of the month. And thank you so much for joining us. I hope we see you on the 22nd. Now, oh, before everyone goes, if you know of someone who you think would be an interesting speaker or you've heard someone else before, would you please pop me an email and we'll look and see and I'll forward those those um, names off to Liz Cameron. The, Alita had done that with us for Maria Solis, who is uh, going to be our opera singer. That's uh, a new relative of hers. So, you know, the, it, it works really well. That way we get a really good diverse mix of people and, and we, we meet all sorts of interests. So thank you so much. And we will talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye bye have a great day you too you too oh. oh let's see how i could have done that so lorraine don't go did you go you, you're going to stay behind for a few minutes and I'll, I'll see if i can do this through um my screen share with you okay if anyone wants to see how to change their address or their demographics on wild africa that's what i'm going to be doing with uh um, with Lorraine in just a moment. Let's call this interpretive.